from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Rosemary O'Neill, and I am um, with the Women's Office at the Department of State. Um, I've been handling uh, women in Afghanistan, our policy with regard to women in Afghanistan. And one of the great personal pleasures that has come to me out of the tragic situation that has transpired in Afghanistan in the last 23 years is meeting some absolutely wonderful uh, women from Afghanistan. <clears throat> Their courage is truly remarkable, and um, uh, the challenges that they have had to meet and address, and um, the fact that they are now um, beginning to have a voice in the rebuilding of their country is very, very exciting. So we're going to meet some of those women today and hear from them. Uh, Senzel Naweed will be speaking first. She has taught at New York University the University of Arizona, and the University of Michigan. She received a BA in history from Kab Kabul University, an MA in history from the University of Denver, and a PhD in Middle Eastern Studies from the University of Arizona. She has written extensively and lectured on women in Afghanistan. She's going to, she's going to talk to us about um, Afghan Women Under Marxism, Lessons for Today. And I think, um, you know, they say those who do not study history are doomed to relive it. So um, very keen to listen to the um, implications of what um, happened under the last 20 years to women in Afghanistan. Senzel? Um, well, as um, uh, Rosemary O'Neill said, I'm talking about history. I'm going to take you back uh, into history of Afghan, um, uh, Afghanistan in the 20th century because uh, I think without understanding that part of the history, it would be very difficult to understand what went on later, and uh, particularly uh, the, the period that I'm focusing on is the period that precedes immediately before the uh, Mujahideen takeover and the Taliban which was the period of the uh, Marxist rule in Afghanistan. Uh, it would be very difficult to condense the history of several um, decades and 15 minutes, but I'll try my best. I'll go very quickly over everything. <clears throat> we know relatively little about how ordinary Afghans experienced the opportunities and challenges of the Marxist era 1978-1992 of Afghan history, and virtually nothing about what the period meant to Afghan women. <clears throat> today, today, history has swept aside the socialist experiment with assessment of its achievements tending toward the negative. It was in this 14-year period, uh, wrote Fred Holliday, that the society and politics of the country were brutally transformed from above and below, leading to the chaos of the 1990s in which another radical authoritarian faction, the Taliban, came to power. This paper will examine the politics of the Soviet-backed Afghan Marxist regime with regards to women and the consequences of the Marxist uh, policies for women in Afghanistan in subsequent years. Now, uh, let me tell you that this is a part of an ongoing research what I'm telling you today is a part of my research. It is based on uh, many interviews with uh, men and women who lived during the Marxist era and also on uh, um, uh, government publications in uh, official documents of the period. Um, in order to understand this period, I have to give you a background of what happened, what was the condition of women before the Marxist. Initial efforts to improve the status of women in Afghanistan began in the 1920s with King Amanullah. 
Reforms initiated by King Amar Allah included the extension of public education to girls, uh, four reaching changes to family law, and the unveiling of women. And I must tell you that the emancipation of women in Afghanistan during the 1920s was probably one of the most uh, revolutionary uh, advanced uh, um, uh, women emancipation movement in the Middle East. Uh, especially the family law of the period was so, uh, was considered to be so advanced that the Bolsheviks used the uh, Afghan family law to, uh, to, to as a model for reforms in uh, Soviet Central Asia. <coughs> Ultimately, Amonullah's attempt to improve the status of women was one of the major causes of the widespread clergy-backed revolts that eventually led to his abdication in January of 1929. With the departure of King Amonullah, women were again veiled, and the pace of change benefiting women slowed down drastically. From the early 1930s through the 1950s, the government uh, undertook a slow expansion of girls' schools in urban centers. In 1958, the government adopted a new, a cautious program to unveil women and encourage entry into the workplace and into public life. In 1964, a new constitution granted women the franchise in equal employment opportunities. By the 1970s, the status of women and popular attitude toward women changed in urban areas. It became acceptable for women to seek higher education, work outside the home, and take part rather life of the community. Although old patterns of behavior were not uprooted, I want to emphasize on that, and disparities between urban and rural life began to grow during this period, Government policies with regard to women provided opportunities for education and paid work in urban uh, areas and prepared the ground for popular acceptance of women in the public arena. So, when the pro-Soviet Hezbi Demokratike Khalqa Afghanistan, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, which is abbreviated as the PDPA, was formed in 1965, it was able to attract to its rank a number of female high school and university students in major Afghan cities. In 1965, the Center Committee of the PDPA granted permission for the formation of the Democratic Organization of Afghan Women, which is called DOAW, uh, uh, under the direction of Dr. Anahita Ratabzad. When the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, gained power in a coup on April 27, 1978, it went further than any previous regime in the effort to liberate, to liberate women by pushing for radical changes in the structure of Afghan society. To understand the politics, the political dynamics of the Marxist era with regard to women in Afghanistan, it's necessary to understand certain aspects of Marxist-Leninist theory to which the leaders of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan adhere. Marxist-Leninist feminist theory, as probably most of you know, uh, connects the oppression of women with the broader issue of class struggle. Double moral standards for men and women, according to the Marxists, originate in class society and are inherent in the patriarchal family system that determines six roles and perpetuates the suppression of women. Lenin went even further by identifying imperialism as the main enemy of the oppressed, including women. Leninist theorists then define women as the proletariat and argued that women will be able to secure full control over their lives and reshape their destinies only 
as an integral force in the world's socialist revolution. Guided by Marxist-Leninist ideology, the PDP leaders linked Afghanistan's backwardness uh, to the structure of tribal feudalism and promoted women's emancipation liberation, uh, I mean, women's uh, emancipation movement as central tenets in the fight against feudalism, capitalism, and Western imperialism. In so doing, uh, the uh, regime, uh, the Marxist regime, uh, regime pushed the issue of women's emancipation to its radical extremes in Afghanistan. Similar, to, uh, similar in content to measures in, introduced during the 1920s by King Amarullah, Decree 1907, issued in the October of 1978 by the Revolutionary Council, abol abolished forced marriages the exchange of women in marriage for cash and extravagant wedding expenses. It also limited the amount of mahr or bridal money and set the age of engagement in marriage at 16 for women and 18 for men. However, unlike uh, King Amonullah, the PDPA leaders were careful not to temper with uh, provisions of Islamic law relating to polygamy. The divorce law was not officially announced, but the introduction of family courts presided over by women judges provided a hearing for discontented wives and protected their rights to divorce, alimony, child custody, and child support. Along with the promotion of degree, 19, uh, degree number seven, the regime launched an aggressive literacy campaign to strengthen to uh, strengthen uh, its base of support among women. Female party members were encouraged to fight along with men to counter feudalism and the negative uh, influences of Western imperialism in Afghanistan. In 1984, the DOAW maintained that the organization has succeeded in uniting approximately, uh, approximately 30,000 women and 669 primary organizations and had mobilized more than 80,000 rural women in social production. The campaign to engage women as a revolutionary force for change in Afghanistan a traditional Islamic society with entrenched tribal and patriarchal values was bound to ignite a strong reaction from the forces of tradition. In fact, the campaign for women's eman emancipation was the impetus for the first mass pro protest against the Marxist regime in 1978-79, resulting in the deaths of two women activists in Herat. Dramas <clears throat> depicting women in feudal bondage on television and on a flag day parade in which female students were televised, dancing and chanting Marxist slogans and waving red flags infuriated money. Most of the female students participating in the parade were from Kandahar. As it turned out, many Kandahari fathers who had pleaded to get their daughters admitted at Kabul University before the April Revolution were deeply offended by the participation of their daughters on the flag day parade. And as you know, Kandahar is the home of the Taliban. Many of, uh, many, uh, for many Afghan Muslims, women's liberation was associated <coughs> with atheism and the disastrous times that had befallen their country were frequently attributed to prom promiscuity associated with the emancipation of women um, uh, in Afghanistan. So women are always blamed for everything. And this is what happened then. <laughs> um, civil war combined uh, with Afghanistan's economic backwardness created serious set setback to the Soviet-inspired reforms. The issue of women's 
rights and women's emancipation was de-emphasized as counter-revolutionary forces gained strength. In 1978, a change in the leadership of the PDPA brought Dr. Najibullah to power. Realizing the, grad the gravity of the situation, Najib proposed national reconciliation and discarded all Soviet-inspired policies including efforts to politicize women in support of Marxist revolution. However, Najib's efforts to abrogate extreme measures adopted by the previous regime had little effect in changing the attitude of the opposition groups. The general reaction against the feminist movement launched by the Marxists was so strong that many PDPA members, including Najib himself, prevented their wives from participating in public affairs in fear of terrorist attacks against them by opposition groups. In a society not yet ready to see women enjoy equal rights with men, the PDPA's highly politicized women's liberation movement unleashed fundamentalist Islamic attitudes toward women that were now hard to reverse. These extreme attitudes resulted in the torture, rape, and brutal murder in Kabul of many women alleged to be atheist communists after the fall of the Najib government in 1992. Resentment against uh, women's emancipation was articulated in a religious verdict signed by 16 members of the Judiciary Council of the, after the Mujahideen takeover. This is not the Taliban. And I want you to remember that this happened before the Taliban took over. The verdict reads in part, the Muslim people of Afghanistan launched a jihad, fought for 14 years, and lost numerous lives in order to reestablish the divine ordinances in the country. Now that by the grace of the Almighty, our Islamic country is free from the bondage of the atheist rule, we strongly demand the immediate enforcement of veiling. We recommend that women be banned from television, radio, and government offices, and that all girls' schools, which are in reality the hub of the hub for debauchery and adulterous practices be closed down. This verdict was the signal for the Taliban to exclude women from public life and push them back into the home. Some lessons may be drawn from the experience of the Marxist era. The most important initiative of the Marxist period with regard to the status of women was to make education available to women of all ages and classes. The PDPA's literacy campaign, if successful, would have improved the position of women even in the remote villages of Afghanistan. The aspects of the literacy campaign of the Marxist era, which were not offensive to Afghan culture, might serve as a model for the expansion of education for women in Afghanistan. <coughs> Also, significant was the regime's efforts to empower women by teaching them organizational skills and encouraging them to be involved in Afghan politics and become active members of Afghan civil society. On the other hand, however, the experience of the Marxist people, period illustrates the adverse effects of combining women issues with partisan propaganda rooted in non-Islamic ideology. The highly politicized women's emancipation campaign based on the ideology of class struggle propelled women into the forefront of the clash between ideological radicalism of the Marxists and the traditional Muslim indigenous society, ultimately resulting in a serious setback and the liberation of women in Afghanistan. The Marxist experience in Afghanistan has been characterized as the failure of revolution from above. 
It represents a case of a weak state attempting to enforce revolutionary changes from the top. And this has happened twice in Afghan history, in fact. Twice during the 20th century Afghan, in Afghan history, uh, once in the 1920s and then during the Marxist era in the 1980s, the state attempted to bring revolutionary changes in the status of women. In both instances, the mobilization of women was met with strong opposition by reactionary forces and created a major backlash. The struggle for women's right in Afghanistan is an ongoing process. I believe strongly in the, in the power and, and the potential, potentials of Afghan women. However, now that a window of hope has opened to the Afghan woman to assert their proper place in Afghan society, it's important for the advocates of women's rights to pay heed to the outcome of the radical campaigns of the 1920s and the 1980s. Two decades of war resulted in the total demise of the modernization efforts of the earlier periods and re-entrenched traditional values with regard to women. It would seem prudent to establish a set of priorities and proceed incrementally and uh, also proceed with a plan that have long-term effects on the status of women of Afghanistan. Thank you. All right. Um, well, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, women's state and development in Afghanistan, although I think I should also have called this women's state, the international community and development uh, in Afghanistan. Um, the country is, as you are, uh, as you are aware, uh, currently owing a political transition in the context of poverty, underdevelopment, and infrastructural devastation through war. The challenges of reconstruction are quite daunting, and uncertainty remains about the nature of governance in Afghanistan. It's similarly unclear how women will fare given the continuing warfare and the lack of clarity in women and gender issues on the part of the leadership. There have been some positive developments since the Bonn meetings of last year, but some areas of concern as well. Now the type of state and legal system that emerges from the present transitional period will determine the extent and manner in which women's interests and women's needs are addressed in the country. Conversely, how genders are addressed will reveal much about the uh, nature of the governance structures, the vision of the country's leadership, and the national identity that is to be constructed in post-Taliban Afghanistan. Because in Afghanistan, as elsewhere, the woman question has been tied to competing concepts of national identity and has been central to battles between traditionalists and modernizers um, through most of modern uh, Afghan history. We've heard uh, from uh, Dr. Senzel Navid's uh, brilliant exposition about the difficulties of uh, the Marxist era, and I will touch upon that very, very briefly. Um, because in my work, I have argued that in at least three periods uh, during the 20th century, women's rights in Afghanistan um, have been very highly politicized, but also central to the political conflicts in the country. Um, the first period is the 1920s, which Dr. Uh, uh, Navid uh, referred to, uh, when efforts by reformers, nationalists, and modernizers to improve the status of women, to establish an education system, and to modernize the economy and society met with the fierce resistance of traditionalists and the ulama, the Islamic clergy. The second period was the 1970s and the 1980s, when two opposing movements, one Marxist modernizing and the other Islamist traditionalist, clashed and fought a long and bloody war over divergent political agendas, cultural understandings, and conceptions of women's rights and women's place. 
And in the 1990s, the third period, the Taliban gave new meaning to this concept of social exclusion, which is a term that has become very fashionable in uh, European social theory and develop international development circles, um, when it instituted draconian policies against not only women's public participation, but their very visibility. So the question is, um, for those of us who do sort of a historical sociology, um, why has there been such limited progress on women's rights, including women's literacy and educational attainment in Afghanistan? Why has the question of women been so vexed in modern Afghan history? Well, I have argued in my previous work that the advancement of women's rights in Afghanistan has been historically constrained by three factors. First is the patriarchal nature of gender and social relations, deeply embedded in the traditional communities in Afghanistan and expressed also in the uh, tribal code of the Pashtuns called the Pakhtunwale. Uh, the second factor is the existence of a weak central state, which has been unable since at least the beginning of the 20th century to implement uh, modernizing programs and goals in the face of ethnic divisions, entrenched rural interests, and tribal feudalism. And these two factors are interconnected, for the state's weakness is correlated with a strong, if fragmented, society that has been resistant to state bureaucratic expansion, civil authority, regulation, monopoly of the means of violence, and extraction, that is, the business of modern states. And the third constraining factor has been uh, opportunistic interventions by neighboring countries and the United States and until the 1930s Great Britain, which served to intensify tribal or ethnic conflict, stall or set back socioeconomic development and increase women's insecurity. So these three factors, I have argued, behind the defeat of the modernizing efforts of King Amanullah in the 1920s, the incapacity of the governments during the uh, Zahir Shah era, 1933 to 1973, and the defeat of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan's attempt to implement a wide-ranging program for land reform, women's rights, and social development in the 1980s. The patriarchal social structure, ethnic divisions, and tribal feudalism also explained the disintegration of the Mujahideen government, 1996, and the inability of both the Mujahideen and the Taliban to undertake reconstruction and development, let alone women's rights. Throughout most of the 20th century, therefore, a patriarchal social structure, the absence of a strong, centralized, and modernizing state, and conflictual international relations, the Great Game, the Cold War, regional rivalries, these factors relegated Afghan women to a status that could only generously be called second citizenship. Um, and during the long reign of Zahir Shah, for example, the country did experience relative peace and stability, but very little social development took place, as we heard. Um, the tiny elite in Kabul managed to insert a gender equality clause in the 1964 constitution and four women joined the new parliament the next year. But by the late 1970s, uh, fully 94% of women were illiterate. Moreover, 89% of village, primary and secondary schools were for boys, while only 11% of schools were for girls. World Bank data show that in 1981, the secondary school gross enrollment rate for girls was only 4.5% compared with 33% in Iran and 7.9% uh, in Pakistan. And I have a graph that really um, uh, dramatically illustrates uh, the extent to which Afghanistan in uh, the late 1970s and in 1980s, sort of on the eve of the Marxist revolution and immediately afterwards, um, was really very, very much behind on every socioeconomic indicator compared to their neighbors, Pakistan, and especially compared to Iran. So, this graph shows um, Comparative statistics on educational uh, enrollments in the three countries in 1981 using World Bank um, statistics and data. Um, the, f uh, the variables are primary school pupils, percent female, primary education, 
uh, teachers percent female and secondary school enrollment percent gross female. The short bar is Afghanistan, the middle bar is Pakistan, and the tallest bar, of course, is Iran. So you can get a sense of how much uh, further behind Afghanistan was compared to its neighbors um, as late as 19, um, 1981 or 78, uh, 79, uh, 80. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So the, re the results of this situation were that apart from a very small, albeit very talented, urban female elite, the vast majority of Afghan women experienced social exclusion, illiteracy, poor health, and subordination. And um, uh, Afghanistan did lag behind its neighbors um, for quite some time. But even so, some progress was made, as uh, Senzel Navid pointed out, uh, in uh, girls' schools enrollments between 1981 and 1991, that is to say during the period of Marxist rule. And the female proportion at the tertiary level was especially remarkable. There we go. Okay. No. Oh, there. Uh, oh, I see. I have to do it that way. All right, fine. Okay. Um, as you can see, between 1980, you know, I should point out that statistics are very. Um, less than precise in many developing countries, and especially in a country like Afghanistan, where the most scientific surveys have all, uh, been uh, carried out with only great, great difficulty and very infrequently. Um, so these are estimates, but you know we have to deal with what we have. Um, as you can see, between 1981 and 1991, primary school uh, enrollment, and in particular the percentage that was female, almost doubled. So there was some progress, even though there was a very uh, non-conducive uh, environment, i.e. Uh, the internationalized civil conflict that took place during most of the 1980s. Um, and the uh, secondary school pupils, the percent female was 32.2% uh, in 1991. Uh, so this also gives you a sense of the progress. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, according to the 1989 UN report on Afghanistan by the UN Special Rapporteur, Dr. Felix um, Ermakora, and he was in Kabul at the same time that I was there in January, February of 1989. His report uh, uh, mentions that there were seven higher education institutes in Kabul with a total of 15,319 students of both sexes and the Medical Institute, um, uh, under the Ministry of Public Health, had really integrated a lot more students. Um, for example, a total of 18,000 students in 1989, compared with a total enrollment of 7,000 um, in 77-78. And in 1989, uh, Kabul University had about 7,000 students, of which 65% were women. So the next time you hear the um, statistics, that before the Taliban came to power, 40% of civil servants were women and 60% of the university um, students were female. Um, it should be pointed out that this was the era before um, the Mujahideen, i.e. during the communist era, not in the early 1990s, but during the communist era. Thank you. Um, all right. Well. Uh, Let's look ahead a little bit to, towards reconstruction and development with women and how um, uh, current policies and laws might be able to meet what uh, researchers within the field of gender and development define as women's practical needs and their strategic gender interests. And of course, practical needs have to do with basic uh, issues of literacy and health and uh, water and shelter um, and perhaps a second uh, tier of uh, educational attainment and so on. And the strategic gender interests have to do with um, helping to realize women's uh, equality, autonomy, and empowerment. And of course, this has to be regarded as holistic. That is to say, without meeting women's basic needs, you can't uh, help to realize women's strategic uh, interests. But also that meeting women's strategic interests, that is to say, attaining equality, autonomy, and empowerment, also requires a conducive legal environment. And the difference between 
uh, Afghan women today, and Afghan women in the 1970s and 1980s, when they were really more or less neglected by the international community, was that today they are enjoying the benefit of a new international environment that really places a high uh, premium on gender equality and women's participation. And this is partly a legacy of the UN Decade for Women, but it's partly a legacy of what we may uh, call global feminism, which really came into its own after the 1985 Nairobi Conference. And it's sort of no accident that by the time the Taliban came to power in 1996, global feminism was in full swing. Um, and it became the target, the Taliban regime became the target of a highly mobilized and organized transnational feminist movement with a commitment to the universality of women's human rights and the benefit of uh, technological know-how. And we heard a little bit about this um, in, uh, during the uh, internet um, uh, discussion earlier today. But the question is, will this new global environment favoring women's rights influence planning policies and resource allocations for a post-Taliban Afghanistan in a way that uh, benefits women and girls? Well, certainly the transnational uh, feminist uh, movement uh, can be relied upon to monitor the situation, to advocate and, and promote um, the rights of women and girls and so on. Um, but the question still is whether uh, post-Taliban Afghanistan will adopt the legal and policy frameworks conducive to the realization and expansion of uh, women's needs and rights. One area of concern uh, pertains to the legal frameworks that are to be decided upon by the next Loya Jerga. The Bonn Agreement um, that took place last year stipulated that the new constitution and the legal framework should be drafted, quote, in accordance with Islamic principles, international standards, the rule of law, and Afghan legal traditions. That's quite a broad remit, and we can expect some disagreement among the um, political forces over the mix and hierarchy of international, secular, religious, traditional practices and, and codes. And the legal framework that, which is, as I said, as yet unclear, will be able to determine and shape women's um, uh, interests and needs. Um, the challenges are very daunting, and my last... Um, And my last uh, overhead um, illustrates, again, some of the daunting challenges with respect to the most basic needs um, of, um, of Afghan uh, women and men and girls. So what are some of the major needs of uh, Afghan women? Um, in an article that I published in uh, the journal World Development in 1994, I identified some of the um, uh, the, uh, the major concerns and the needs um, at the time, and they're actually still quite pertinent and salient. What are they? Literacy, basic and formal education, and the closing of the gender gap in access um, uh, to, uh, to uh, educational attainment. Healthcare, uh, there are serious gender gaps and special problems such as maternal mortality, infant and child mortality, TB, mental illness, drug addiction, and so on. Um, there needs to be activities and therapies for women and girls suffering war-related uh, uh, traumas. There need to be special programs for widows and disabled women, vocational training, rehabilitation, generating projects, skills training and upgrading, refresher courses for those who have been unemployed for some time, micro projects, handicrafts, food processing enterprises, then killing manufacturing, jewelry, a lot of these sorts of things that, that women can be integrated into, and of course the legal rights for uh, urban women. Um, and I was pleased that uh, in the, um, uh, the Afghan Women's um, Action Plan, um, which was decided upon last March um, and will be uh, uh, coordinated by uh, the Ministry for Women's um, Affairs, um, some of these uh, priority areas have uh, been delineated, and four in particular were prioritized, and they are advocacy and legal aid training. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, literacy, uh, widows and orphans, and reproductive health. So, uh, just to, um, uh, to wrap up, I'm pleased to hear that um, the uh, State Department, and I'm uh, grateful to Rosemary uh, O'Neill for um, 
uh, for making this information uh, available to me, um, has designed some valuable projects for Afghan women. Some of these projects are ongoing and some of them are proposed. And uh, I think we, uh, we have to wait and see um, what the uh, extent of the implementation of these projects will be and also what the impact of these projects will be. I should also point out that there are some serious problems with funding. Um, a total of $4.5 billion was allocated for the reconstruction of, of Afghanistan um, and a number of different countries uh, were to uh, contribute to this fund. But uh, as recently as last month, of the $1.8 billion which was supposed to be allocated this year, fully $1.2 billion is still outstanding. So many Afghans are very concerned and Afghan women are very concerned about two things. One, about the low level of funding that has been made available thus far, and two, uh, the whole question of, um, uh, of uh, security. So uh, one can only hope that uh, women's needs and rights will be prioritized, that sufficient levels of funding will be forthcoming, and there's been some very serious disagreements over the level and, um, um, uh, and extent of, of funding. And um, also that um, Afghan women themselves will be able to, and I'm sure they will be able to, uh, make a strong case for why their needs and their rights need to be prioritized and fully integrated into any programs and strategies for reconstruction um, and development and peace building in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know you must be all very tired at the end of the long day, so I'll basically um, focus my remarks uh, today re on the emergence of civil society, uh, its role and its function uh, in, Af in Afghanistan, uh, my home country. Uh, although I'll focus my remarks on women with whom, Afghan women with whom I've worked with, with almost two decades, I also want to note that my organization, Refugee Women in Development, REFWID, uh, has worked extensively with war-affected women and their male counterparts in various parts of, of the world. And I do want to stress that although we are a, a women in development organization working with uh, women who have been affected by war and conflict, uh, we also include men because especially in uh, Islamic societies such as the one I originate from, it's extremely important to work in that context. Uh, now let me move on briefly to talk about REFWIT, um, its programs and a little bit on the, on the history of our work. We have so far in the past 23 uh, years provided training and technical assistance to hundreds of civil society organizations um, uh, led by women and their male counterparts and we have basically strengthened uh, and focused on in strengthening the independent sector transition from uh, war to peace and to democracy. Uh, we remain convinced that the existence of strong civil society is essential to monitor the functions of political institutions in a democracy, especially one that is transitioning uh, and emerging from war and um, an emerging democracy. Uh, with regard to Afghan women, we have worked extensively by providing training, technical assistance, and small grants to help upgrade the capacities of women, community grassroots organizers uh, uh, who have organized in uh, Pakistan and Iran, and most recently, of course, in Afghanistan. Um, we help women uh, with their networking opportunities, and we make sure that women are empowered to lead efforts uh, which promote changes uh, in their human rights conditions and in their in the human in, in this, uh, conditions in general and to basically serve as agents of, of change and to participate uh, actively in the reconstruction of Afghanistan and a civil society. Our philosophy basically is, uh, although I myself am a product of the Afghan war and have worked extensively with my um, compatriots uh, in other parts of the world, uh, I do not believe in act basically taking um, or imposed models to any situation because it doesn't apply, particularly in, in the case of Afghanistan. 
uh, we made sure that when we worked with the civil society leaders and organizers, we made sure that we listened to them, we consulted them with them extensively to basically assess what their needs are and basically what their felt needs are and then this, uh, this develop uh, models that's appropriate and meets their needs uh, and which is in the context of, of their own aspirations. Uh, we believe very um, much in the empowerment and inclusion of Afghan women in the reconstruction of Afghan society. And to accomplish this, we basically um, have, we, we think it's important for women to have access to information, um, organizational management, and leadership skills. And the women, Afghan women I've worked with basically tell me that it's important for them to work in unison with uh, other indigenous Afghan groups and international organizations, and they are telling me um, constantly that they need regional and international linkages, particularly um, with women in the Muslim world and Muslim societies, because they need information on Islamic humanitarian principles, uh, because this is a, this is the way this is the information they need in order to use those. Uh, that information and those models to uh, progress in their own societies. Um, we have worked consistently and pursued two aims. One, to rebuild the shattered civil society institutions in Afghanistan by extending our programs to war affected uh, Afghans in Afghanistan and across the border as refugees and internally displaced people. And we assist Af Afghan community grassroots organizations operating in Iran and Pakistan to basically relocate within Afghanistan. So far, we have trained, we are, we're an organization that has worked extensively across gender and across uh, sectarian and ethnic affiliations. We have trained and worked with 90 Afghan civil society institutions from various uh, uh, ethnic um, uh, representations and we have provided small grants to 13 Afghan NGOs to support their projects. And we have worked with many groups uh, who were under, working under the Taliban clandestinely to help uh, women to continue their work uh, to provide education uh, and skills training to women who were in Afghanistan. Let me state that during the past two decades in Afghanistan, uh, military regimes um, have focused, their focus has been on war and the war economy, uh, which has led to the breakdown of the Afghan social uh, fabric, which has kept the voices of tolerant and democratic-minded uh, Afghans muted. In essence, um, for the past 23 years, the story in Afghanistan has been that of empowerment, but empowerment of the communists, the holy warriors, and then the empowerment of the Taliban. But nowhere has the story of the empowerment of the Afghan people taken place. And the international community must empower war-affected Afghans to rebuild their economies, and it's time to finance Afghan-led efforts to promote peace and the building of democ democratic civil institutions to balance the powerful political institutions. Now let me move on and to talk a little bit about the impact of war uh, in Afghanistan. We all know that uh, the war has had a very serious impact on both the social, political, and the physical structure of the Afghan society. Our society has been ravaged by the 23 years of conflict. Uh, two million Afghan lives have been lost, one million landmine handicapped, 12 million women living in abject poverty. And according to the Human uh, Development Index of the United Nations Development Program, average life expectancy is 46 years, uh, a mortality rate of 25.7% for children under five years old, and an illiteracy rate of 64%. And Afghanistan ranks amongst the most destitute, war-damaged countries in the world in terms of human development. And an average of 46 women die every day in Afghanistan. Rampant poverty has long characterized um, Afghanistan. And 1996 takeover by the Taliban, a faction of religious extremists, um, is the most recent assault in a long history of oppressive regimes. And this is something that I must underscore. 
uh, under the Taliban, women in particular um, was sub subjected to a severe form of government and deprivation of their basic human rights. Today, approximately 1.2 million Afghan refugees still reside in Pakistan, 1.4 million um, in Iran, and an estimated 1.7 million refugees, uh, Afghans who are displaced internally within the borders of Afghanistan. As in most um, war conditions, uh, the majority of uh, the refugees and the internalist displaced people are women and their children. And the magnitude of this tragedy is so mind-boggling that few outside Afghanistan can, can conceptualize an approach, let alone a solution. And here is where the problem lies. And if we don't take that into uh, consideration, I don't think the solutions from the outside will work um, in a basically affecting change and bringing sustainable um, democracy and development in Afghanistan. Let me move on to, this, to outline a few uh, basic um, issues that's affecting the status of women. The status of women, I'm sure as most of you know, uh, in, in Afghanistan what ranks amongst the worst in the world. And the statistics indicate that one in every woman dies in childbirth or pregnancy related complications every 30 minutes. 70% of all diagnosed tuberculosis cases occur in women. This is the highest TB rate in the world. Literacy is among the lowest in the world. It is estimated that 80% of the Afghan women cannot read or write, and women are the poorest of the poor. And in fact, they are leading what we call in the field of development the feminization of poverty and the feminization of forced migration. Maternal and infant mortality rates amongst the highest in the world. And an Afghan child is 25 times more likely to die before the age of five. And 300,000 women, uh, sorry, children die each year from preventable diseases. And although there are no statistics on mental health, we know that women are highly traumatized by the impact of war and um, suicide rates are rapidly on the rise and obviously women are amongst the most undernourished. And the dem demo demographics of Afghanistan is such that it's a society that's largely composed of women who are taking charge of not only their own lives but an estimated one million children who are orphaned, the elderly, the handicapped, while they themselves are heavily traumatized malnourished and under-supported. Despite these daunting challenges, Afghan women have demonstrated remarkable abilities uh, to transcend their image as victims and instead excel as resources for development. And this is uh, something that I would like to underscore. I'll move on now how they have demonstrated their um, ability uh, given these daunting challenges. The NGO movement and the burgeoning of a civil society in Afghanistan, how did it come about? Um, we know that the past 23 uh, years of war, we have not had a government, and the, uh, we've had military regimes, and obviously um, the Afghan people were heavily impacted by a lack of government that would provide basic services that normally you would um, have access to during times of peace. So Afghan women basically realized that um, they had to take matters in their own hands. So they basically organized their communities uh, in exile in Iran, in Pakistan, and also uh, inside Afghanistan at, during the time of the Taliban to provide the very critically needed human services in their communities. They provided education, health, human rights, and uh, social services um, to their own communities. And they were doing so on the grave with great, at great risk to themselves and their families. Uh, and the Af many Afghans and the scores of Afghans that are, are living in um, these conditions assert that the seed for democracy and democratic institution building and civil society uh, for the future of Afghanistan lies with them, within them. And so therefore, it's imperative that technical assistance and resources be committed uh, to the human and the institutional resource development of the indigenous Afghan women uh, community leaders and their male counterparts. 
However, so far, the efforts to um, focus on the independent sector in Afghanistan has been very short-term and sporadic. We have looked at the situation in Afghanistan as an emergency, although this has existed for the past 23 years, and obviously short-term uh, development schemes and emergency relief schemes are very different. If you want to really impact change, it's important that um, a long-term policy uh, and activities that long-term that builds the capacity and the skills of the Afghan people uh, is imperative to effect change. We cannot do development assistance and rebuilding the ravaged social fabric of, of the Afghan society through short-term projects. And we must support the embry embryonic uh, burgeoning of the Afghan civil society institutions um, uh, because without that we, we will not be empowering the Afghan people. What, what do we need now to bring a change? First of all, we, it is important for us to realize that because there is there's emphasis uh, on the gender issues and development issues in Afghanistan, uh, we are very pleased to see that. However, uh, the implementation strategies and the vision with, that goes with this um, policy really uh, is lacking. Uh, it, we must make sure that we establish a structure uh, that emphasizes in building the capacities and empowering the Afghan people um, rather than bringing the kind of approaches that really don't work within the Afghan society. We need to, to speak and consult and actively involve Afghan women themselves in the planning, in the design, in, in the implementation of all uh, efforts to uh, build the um, the fabric of the Afghan society, and particularly the, the independent sector. So far, so too much emphasis and has been paid on building the governance structures in Afghanistan and the political institutions. I know that it's very important that in a new democracy, one that is uh, emerging from conflict, is important to do that. But however, if you neglect the uh, civil society sector, uh, we are making a grave mistake. So there, has, there needs to be more emphasis on the civil society sector and the uh, NGO sector. However, we need to make sure that we understand wh who the NGOs are, who are the credible NGOs are, who are the leaders, and how do we provide uh, training and assistance and small grants. But we also need to make sure that um, we provide a system that uh, it monitors and provides, uh, establishes transparency and accountability of these grassroots organizations that are emerging to provide services in their communities. Um, now, let me conclude my remarks uh, by saying that uh, we as Afghan women are very pleased that the window of opportunity has opened for us and we have hope, but we need to make sure that the Afghan people are given a voice um, and they are empowered because I think that the best solution to um, bring to the war on terrorism and to waging uh, war on intolerance in Afghanistan lies within the Afghan people and the Afghan people uh, are very tolerant minded and, and civil society minded. However, so far we have not heard their voices. We have heard the very extreme right and the extreme left voices emerging from Afghanistan. And it's time for us to dispel those myths and, re and realize what is the true nature of the Afghan people. So I urge you to educate yourselves about uh, who the Afghan people are uh, and what their needs are in order to bring sustainable democracy and peace in Afghanistan. It's imperative that it's time to, that we actually empower the Afghan people and give a voice to the Afghan women because 67% of the Afghan population right now is women and without them we will not succeed. I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions later on. I'd like to share with you some experiences since I've been in Afghanistan since December 26th, 22nd, the transfer of power, the day that power was transferred from um, President Rabbani to President Karzai. Um, lots of major changes have occurred since 1999 when I was in Kabul. Um, like music, you can actually hear music on the streets now. Kids are going back to school. Um, there is um, 
shops are all opened up. You know, there's actually life where before, during the Taliban, when I, when I arrived in Kabul, it felt like the soul of the, the city is taken out of its body and people were just sitting around doing nothing. And of course, women couldn't go out. Um, we even have some traffic lights now and occasionally a car stops when the light is red. Um, and if they do stop, we have a traffic jam and then you can't get out of it. Um, there are 25 embassies opened in Kabul. Uh, peacekeepers are there, so a lot of wonderful things going on, but we must realize that we cannot cover up scars with cosmetics and we need to work seriously on healing. We at Afghanistan leave are focusing on healing through education, allowing the kids to write, to paint. Um, you should see the, the pictures that the children paint. It was much easier to defeat the Taliban than it is to deal with the legacy they left behind. And that is the emotional state of the Afghan people. I opened up five underground schools for girls when I was in Kabul in 1999, and the Taliban came and beat them up until their hands were bleeding. Um, they beat up their teacher in front of them, but they never stopped coming. They, they just found other strategies to come to school so that the Taliban don't see them. They came one by one, wrapped up their books with the cover of Quran, and they came up with all kinds of ideas. Um, UNICEF summary report says that the total of learning space in Afghanistan right now is 6,784. That means the formal and non-formal education. And, and non-formal education are, are the schools that are, are schools, but they're not registered. Um, with the ministry right now. There are 4,686 formal schools and there are 2,098 non-formal schools, but they, they, couldn't, they couldn't really survey all of the non-formal schools. I think there are a lot more than just 2,000. And there are total teachers, 73,074. Female teachers are 20,566 and male teachers are 52,000. 507. Um, it's only in Kabul where female teachers exceed male teachers by 30 percent. The biggest problem right now is that um, there, there are gener a, a generation of 12 to 16 year old girls who are sitting at first, second, and third grade. 48 percent of the students currently are at first grade. 14 percent are at second grade. 11 percent are at third grade. 8% are at fourth grade, 2% are at eighth grade, um, I'm sorry, yeah, eighth grade, and then 1% are at ninth, 11th, and 12th grade. So the, the size of the 12th grade classes are very, very small. Um, sanitation and water are the two major problems. 48% of all schools have access to water and only 25% have access to sanitation facilities or toilets. Um, and now I'm gonna share with you some slides and so you could have a picture of what the schools look like as I'm talking. This gives you just an idea of what the city kind of looked like. The, there's a river, there was, there was a river there it's dried up and they, they have opened up a market inside the river called Titanic. Um, they like the movie Titanic so much that now that they could do this, they call it Titanic. Um, so this just kind of gives you a general uh, picture of the city, that building, that high rise, that's the only high rise in the city. On the left is the communication ministry. And the next one. Okay, this is one of the schools that we're supporting in Kabul. It's called Char Qalai Wajirabad. It has 8,345 students. 2,732 of them are girls. 5,613 of them are boys. They have 80 teachers, 80 women teachers and 70 male teachers. Uh, most of the kids 
are learning uh, in very strange uh, facilities. This is a bus. Can you go to the next slide, please? These are, these are these buses, a skeleton of buses that they're sitting in, and it's extremely hot because uh, summer is very hot in Kabul, and, and they're cramped in there. They don't have any tables, and And this is, the top is just, you know, they cut off the, the side of the buses. Um, this is the bus. It looks like it's two stories, but it's just one. And uh, they, there's, there are no chairs, no nothing, nothing even to put under their feet. And this is, Another, another school in a different part of Kabul. Um, there are 1,173 students in this. This is a big house that somebody donated to the school. And there is 556 girls and 617 boys, and they have 52 teachers. Um, so these are the classrooms. They, they do have some chairs and tables that was provided by an organization for them. but most of them are sitting on the, on the floor. Now this is another school that w some German organization, I think, have, have uh, taken care of the building for them, but it's a huge school. They have 10,800 students. Um, we went mostly to this particular school because m all of the uh, the classes, the under classes, underground classes that we had, the kids are sitting on these classes. They, they did very well. The ones who were on third grade, they're on fifth grade, and the ones that were on fifth grade are on seventh grade. Um, they are doing much better than, than the other kids. Um, but they still don't have um, chairs and tables. The, these, this particular school are mostly girls. They have, they have 6,480 girls and only 3,620 boys in this school. It's the same school, right? It just, these are one of our students. So. And they're sitting in the hallways. And these, this, this is like eighth grade. And you can see how much older these girls are than a regular eighth graders that would be on eighth grade. And they're sitting out, they have 20 classes conducting outside. This is one of our students. Oh, what happened? Just, no, no, no. You have to reverse it. Yeah. This is a 12th grade on the, at the same school. Um, they don't have enough chairs and the girls are over 20. Okay, now this is Logar. Um, this is a, a different province in Afghanistan, about an hour and a half away from Kabul. Uh, they're planning on building an international airport in Logar. Um, this is a, a very small little village in Logar. It's 430 years old, this little village. They have never had school. This is the first time that some teachers are coming back uh, from Kabul and they have gathered some students and they've, they've put together this very small little school for, for girls and boys. This is, this is the classroom. And they have only first and second grade. These are these beautiful kids. Nike. I just wanted a, <laughs> a picture of them. <laughs> They're just Amazing kids. You know, they're the same schools.
but they're just so happy they don't have very much. You know, they don't have chairs or books and notebooks or, or anything. You know, they don't even have much to eat, but they're very happy. Now, this is Panjshir Valley from the top. You know, it's just a beautiful, beautiful area with this river runs through it. Um, we have had our projects in Panjshir since 1999. I couldn't go back to Kabul, so we started our projects in Panjshir because that was the only place we could work. So we do have um, a, a school being built right now for girls and we are supporting an orphanage, a small orphanage of 30 kids in Panjshir. Um, so, you know, kids just go by the river and play in the water. Believe it or not, I found a beach. Um, this was sand and these kids naturally knew what to do and they just went and laid by the sand and they were playing with a tank on the river. This is the streets of Panjshir. This is a school that I visited in 2000 when I was in Panjshir. Uh, recently, UNICEF has gone, and it, it was nothing. They, the kids didn't even have all this. There were there was only two rooms, and the kids were all sitting on the on the floor. But now UNICEF has put up these uh, tents for them, and they have they have these classrooms under under the tents with somewhat of a bench at least to sit on. Three hundred and fifteen students, it's a very small class, and the kids were painting were painting their blackboard. Two hundred and sixty-four of these students are all girls, and they only have fifty-four boys. Now, this the slides from this slide on will just show, I mean, scenes of what women do in, in Kabul right now. This is a woman who's holding the, see, she's the police on the street. Women are actually working on the street next to men, fixing up the roads. And these are not very young. I, I asked them how old they are, and one of them, one to the right, said, I must be 50. <laughs> Most women don't know their age, but they think 50 is very old. This is a UNDP uh, bakery. Uh, these, these are mostly widows. Um, their children go to school. They, they, work, they work from 4.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. Those who have daughters 12 and 13 years old, they don't let their daughters go to school because the daughters have to take care of the um, siblings, younger siblings, because the mothers have to come and work here. They don't really have a choice. Refugee women who's, who are coming back and settling in this one area where the, all the houses are destroyed. She was baking bread outside. I bet she was very happy that she can do this at home. These are refugees returning, settling in these destroyed homes. Um, there are no windows, no doors. Um, the, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen to them when, once it gets cold next month. It's going to be raining and freezing. Um, I, I don't know, and they didn't know what to do. They were just going to live day by day and see. Same refugees in the destroyed homes. You know, they're, they're just so happy and playful, and they don't really have very much, you know, no food, no clothing, no nothing, you know, and it's extremely hot, but she just loved to pose in front of the camera, and she followed me around. Children, um, boys, most, most of the boys um, after school go to make money because they are the supporters of the family now. They, they either do shoe polishing or selling water, um, washing cars or selling odds and ends um, because they have to they have to make money. I met this one little girl where I, I passed by one day she was sitting on the street begging and then the next day when I passed by she was laying down and it was extremely hot so I asked the driver to turn around and I stopped next to her and I went and bought her some juice and I came by and some guys approached me and said don't worry about her you know these people this is a trick don't give her money. And I thought, you know, it was fascinating that these kids learned tricks to get, get more money. 
she was making noise, you know, so that she's crying and maybe people will pay her more money. And then as, as we left, she got up and she was walking and then we turned around again and I called her. I said, well, what are you doing here? And she said, um, I'm collecting alms. And I asked her how old you are. She was nine years old. She looked, her skin looked like she's at least 40. And she, she said, well, I said, how come you're, you're collecting alms here? And she said, well, my father was killed in the last bombing of US and I've been doing this for two months now because I have a small brother and my, there's no job for my mother. I gave her a bunch of money and I said, let's go to your house. Can I visit your mom? She said, no, I don't want to go home because my mother will be mad at me because I come home early. So most of the children are either begging out on the streets or, or working to earn about two to three dollars a day to survive for, for the whole family. And they don't have much to eat. At the end of the day, they just eat bread and um, tea and maybe sugar if they have it. But these kids are very happy. I mean, this is what surprises me that they just have such an spirit. This is our computer center in Kabul. Unfortunately, I don't have other slides. If you go to our site, www.afghanistanleave.com, you will see other pictures of the organization and, and our work. And this is a computer center that we have in Kabul. Um, we have many students. It's actually filled up. It's, you know, what, what keeps us working and going is the spirit of the Afghan people and the commitment and the passion that the kids have for learning and knowledge and, and it really makes me work more, want to work more, you know? I mean, the fact that they came, it was in the middle of the winter in December, and all these kids were coming to school for, we normally don't have schools in the winter time because it's very, very cold, but they were preparing for the regular school year for March. And these kids came and most schools had no chairs, nothing on the floors, and they were sitting there freezing, but schools were filled up with, people, with kids. And it was amazing, you know, how, where they got all of that commitment, I, I have no idea. Um, Excuse me, you have to oh, okay, I finished actually. Um, I just want to tell you a short story about this orphanage that we have in Panjshir area. And this is what, what encourages me to work in Afghanistan is that we have 30 orphans. And when I asked them this last time, two weeks ago, what do they want me to bring for them? They said, satellite dish because we want to talk to you when you're there and we want to know what what other fun things is over there and we want to know more about there you know there is like you know they didn't really know where but they knew that there is this other place that I go to and I come back and other people go and come back and there are other things that they just want to know and then when I asked them what do you want to become when you grow up this 80 year old said the president and one, one very major concern for me is that there are still areas in Afghanistan like Nuristan, which is uh, an area where it's very difficult to get to and they have not had any schools in Nuristan, but a lot of Wahhabis have found shelter there and they have only Wahhabi schools. I was trying to go there this time, unfortunately there was not enough time and people thought that I shouldn't go, but because it's, it's too dangerous and this will may become another home for the fundamentalists. Um, thank you very much. of Afghan women is a story of great courage and resiliency and um, uh, we thank you for your moving presentations today. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.